so uh, welcome to Olavo Talks. It's the sixth episode, if I am correct. I'm fast running out of, actually, like I don't know how to count that far. After five, I start getting confused. Mm -hmm. So I believe this is the sixth, but I'm not sure if this is going to be the sixth published as the sixth. I don't know. So maybe it's just an Olavo Talks. Okay. Just an Olavo Talks. Um, I always start off with first explaining what is Olavo Talks. Olavo Talks is a, a podcast slash vodcast video podcast series that I started about in the beginning of this year. And the series is, um, I came, it came from a place of, well, I do a lot of anti-racism activism, feminist activism, LGBT activism in the Netherlands and organizing uh, in the last two years, three years of my life. And I noticed that I was having these amazing conversations with extremely inspiring and inspired activists, art artists, organizers, politicians, you name it. And, um, and I found myself often sort of like getting home and thinking, my God, I learned so much, but I have no record of it. Mm -hmm. I have no way of being able to share that moment either. So then I started sort of thinking about what would be awesome to have a way to like sort of, you know, sort of archive for posteriority for myself, for each other, a way to like sort of record what's going on right now in our lives in terms of uh, whether it's activism, whether it's sort of thinking about how we want the world to change, whether it's um, organizing and so on. So about in January is when I actually got an opportunity to do my very first Olava Talks and I am loving it so much. Um, so another thing uh, I want to tell I always, <laughs> so Olava Talks is also a moment to eat together with people that I really like because a lot of these conversations that I was having with people often involved eating, so I thought we're gonna eat. And um, I wanna tell you a little bit about what we're eating here today. Um, I made, I'm vegan, and one of the things that was sort of like a journey for me about three years ago, like a food journey was sort of like learning how to eat like new things. There were a lot of things that I wasn't eating at all because I was sort of used to specific sort of meat or, dairy products and I didn't really think about like most of the aisles in the store and so I discovered things like lentils and stuff like that. I did not I never ate lentils before <laughs> I ever right so um, this is a, a macaroni uh, 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 bolognese that I make without meat but with lentils which get this like sort of this like sort of this bite and this sort of um, this richness and taste that comes with lentils. So I have found all these new things to eat, all these new things to work with, ingredients to work with, but I also think it's always really fun to eat it the old way. So when I discovered that you can have, like you can eat, ma make a macaroni without using like sort of um, meat replacers, like right. soy, um, oh, yeah. soy ground, anything. ground beef, what, how would you call it? In the, in it yeah, like soy ground beef? Yeah. yeah. Uh, soy chunks. Instead of soy, soy chunks to use, uh, and I really always loved macaroni so much. Right. And so I got an opportunity to eat something new the old way. So that's why we're having this. At least we were gonna have it until we found out that you're allergic. <laughs> to fun fact. Fun fact to carrots. And so we're not gonna be eating, but it's cooked in here. So <sighs> Charlie it's all good. is here with us today. Charlie, I found out about Charlie about a month ago. Somebody sent me a message on Instagram saying, you got to talk to this person. <laughs> he's amazing. He's doing great work. He's going to be in the Netherlands. Get to know him. And uh, then we got in touch. Mm -hmm. And turns out you do a sex as healing workshop. And you're also doing a doula. Uh, um, doula and training. Doula and training. So we had a, sh a short chat on Skype and I was like, oh my God, I got to get to know this person better. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Yes. I'm really excited. It is such a pleasure. You're here in the Netherlands. Yeah. For how long? I'm here until Friday. So okay. it's like a week total. Okay. How has it been so far? Exciting. I It's very much like New York. Okay. Amsterdam, well, specifically. Amsterdam is like New York, really? Yeah, it's like small New York, though. Okay. It's like a little bit slower. Okay. It's like if New York was safe and slower and okay. everybody smoked weed, that's what New York would be like. You think that the weed is the is the clinch? Is the... Uh, more so because, one, it seems like it slows people down. Mm. 
it's not separate from like the coffee shop. So a lot of people spend time in coffee shops mm -hmm. in New York. So I'm like, that's where you get to slow down, you get to interact more. Mm -hmm. I've noticed people aren't on their phones as much. Oh, really? Like New York, everybody on the train is like, oh, on really? their phone. Nobody's talking to each other. So it's really interesting to see people like talking to each other a lot more mm -hmm. and being in coffee shops. I think they're just, just calmer. And I think different kinds of people are interacting because like the coffee shops, have a mix of like you can have the alcohol so you have some people who are there drinking and smoking mm -hmm. you have people who are just actually drinking coffee and smoking or just hanging out like it's just it's different <laughs> have like you been out this is is this your first time outside of a coffee shop since you've been there <laughs> <laughs> yeah. have you just found a home in the town yeah, we like we were walking around and i was like this is another coffee shop <laughs> another one is another one so yes um, but you you are literally in being in Amsterdam. You're literally at the epicenter mm. of coffee shops in the Netherlands. Like, okay, that's where you have the most of them. I think in most other cities in the Netherlands, they they don't have such a high density. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'm like every two walk steps is just like okay. another coffee. I was like, how does this happen? Have there have there have there been any things in the Netherlands that have surprised you so far? Uh, outside of the amount of black people, no. Yeah. <laughs> really? so you see like, a lot of wow. black people here. Yeah, well, at least in Amsterdam, like I was. I, I don't was know what neighborhood you're living at. Right, I have no idea where I'm at. So okay. I can't tell you where I'm at. But um, yeah, I was like, okay. I mean, because in my brain, the only other thing I can compare it to is Northern Ireland, and mm -hmm. I'm like, there are no black people in Northern Ireland. I was there for like two weeks at one point, and saw one black person. So it was like really two like, weeks. You saw one black person. One. And we wow. got really excited. <laughs> there was a lot of people. They were like, oh my god, a black person like quickly scurried away. And I was like, no. <laughs> so. I love that. I love indeed when I travel how much I'm on the lookout for other black people. So much. But listen, what were you doing in the island? I was in Northern Ireland. I was doing a project where we were learning about how the civil rights movement impacted uh -huh. um, what was happening in Northern Ireland. So. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. It was like, it was really good. You're doing something really interesting today in the hit. Oh, so Tell excited. Me about I it. am so excited. So we're gonna be at the Hangout, uh, which is an LGBTQ organization. The Hangout um, no, the tough the hangout no zero seventy, which is in the Hague. Because yes. you have different in different cities you have different hangouts. Oh so you're at the one in the in the Hague. In the Hague, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Um so I'm doing my sex as healing workshop. Um, it's the longer name is Sex as Healing, Better Sex and Better Self Care. Okay. So that's what I'm going to be doing. Um, I am thrilled. I know it starts at, what is it, like, I don't know how to say this in like military time. I always forget. So we're doing this at 6.30 p.m. 6.30, yes. Okay, so yeah, that's happening today. I'm very excited. Um, I'm very excited about, too. Like, I don't know. I know my overall dream has been... Like when people are like, what do you want to do, Charlie? Like, what is your big idea? And I was like, well, I'd like to I literally, pay. my pants just actually dropped all the way down while I was sitting, which is where I never thought that was possible. Yeah. <laughs> just went yeah, all the way. Um, See, that's when we get to the juicy part of the time. There, so oh I just love it. Yeah, it's coming off right. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm doing that today. I'm excited because my big idea has been, I was like, the clearest way I can say it is I want to be paid to talk about sex and travel the world. Right? Okay. <laughs> and so, and, but like the more in-depth part of that is like, just in general, we don't have a lot of uh, conversations and, and really important conversations about sex, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, how do I take what I know mm -hmm. and share that? Yeah. How do I take... Um, Learning from my own trauma, learning from my own experience with sex and interactions with people, uh, whether they be sexual partners or like friends who are just talking about sex. How do I now share that information um, in a in a really interesting way? I seem to have a really interesting way. Of you have a method. I think. I mean, because my workshop seems to be very different than what a lot of people even expect. I think when they hear sex as healing, they're like, "Oh, we're gonna have sex, and that's gonna be the healing part." And it's okay. like, actually, it's not. It's not, it's not like people are going to have sex in my workshop. Some people get really excited. Okay, I'm not coming anymore. No, <laughs> Some people get really excited in my workshop. Uh, like, uh, depending on who you come with, uh, what happens, right? Uh, but um, I, I like that people get to talk about sex in a really different way. Mm -hmm. um, you get to talk about sex as literally something that you are doing to heal yourself from trauma, mm -hmm. whether it be sexual trauma or other uh, kinds of trauma. Um, you okay. get to talk a little bit deeper about like your literal body, how it inter how you are interacting with sex, how you mm -hmm. think about your your body and sex. Okay. 
Okay, okay um, wait, before, before you guys are on. Okay, so. <sighs> there is so much. Uh, there is so much. Uh-huh. That, that just, when I first, like, heard that you did this, this uh, sex as healing. Just that already, that sex as healing. In my head just exploded in so many associations and some of them triggers and 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 sort of a need for because first of all the pairing of those two things already <laughs> sex as healing sex is healing mm-hmm. healing sex to me like i haven't had necessarily like the most how do i say the most um the most positive experiences, sexual experiences, mm-hmm. growing up as well. Uh, some of my first uh, sexual encounters were not uh, voluntary. I mean, I was a kid, I was very young, I was six, seven, mm-hmm. with someone much older than me. Um, you know, so, and it has grown into like sort of growing up in the, in the gay, cis gay male community mm-hmm. and just the toxicity around, you know, sort of uh, uh, gender roles and sort of, you know, even like, you know, most of the conversations I have on, on, on Grindr still are very sexualized, mm-hmm. like racially sexualized, yeah. right? So you're seen as a big black person and there's, that's a side of trauma from, I mean, there's so much to me that makes me go like, sex has healed. What are you talking right. about? <laughs> like, sex, mostly, like at the most as sort of like something that you do and you may come out unscathed, but as healing? That's, you're just blowing shit up on me. <laughs> Please break that down. Oh, man. Okay. Um, very much because of what you said, right? Mm-hmm. Um, my first involuntary um, sexual experience was definitely around the time I was like seven or eight. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, for a long time, I didn't tell anybody, mm-hmm. right? And then I came out as, uh, I, know I came out a number of times. So I came out as bisexual, I came out as a lesbian, I came out as... Uh, pansexual, um, then I came out as trans, and every time I came out, one, because I didn't know what would happen, right, I, I didn't know what would happen to me as a young person, like, I was like, my mom's gonna kick me out, or she's gonna disown me, so that being something I was afraid of, but because also, when we add race to it, like, I don't know what's gonna happen to like me or my family members, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know um, if on their way home something happens mm-hmm. and now they don't know this big secret about mm-hmm. me, right? So now, not only having to talk about my sexual trauma, but then to talk about like what I was experiencing as a queer person. Did right? you do like, that at the same time with your... With your... Uh, I think with my mom, I initially, I might have told her about my experience years after it happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and not necessarily, actually it came out because <laughs> because of a sexual experience I was having. Okay. So she caught me having sex with someone. Uh, or she thought she caught me having sex with someone. But she caught me basically in the sense of, I had to now say, Mom, I've been having sex. Okay. That was the thing I yeah. had to do. Yeah. Um, but then along with that, I was like, well, I am having sex by choice. Mm-hmm. But the first time I had sex was not by choice. Yeah. Um, so having to say that um, and then having to reveal... Uh, who my se- who I was sexually attracted to mm-hmm. was also like a part of that in the, around the same time, mm-hmm. um, and so then it was a confusion of like maybe because you have sexual trauma that's why you might be yeah. not as gay and I was like well I've heard that one and I had to sit through that is that it is that what's happening for me and then I realized no I, I've been into uh, at the time same gender folks since kindergarten okay right? like literally since I could say like. I am attracted to someone, it's been like a girl, mm-hmm. right, period. Mm-hmm. Um, but then sometimes it was boys, and so that's why I came out as bisexual. That's why I came out as a lesbian when it was more of an attraction mm-hmm. to girls, but then also still having to explain gender, and, mm-hmm. and that being really hard, mm-hmm. um, because saying girl didn't fit. Yeah. So then it became confusing by the time I was in college um, to explain to my family members, specifically my mom and my dad, of like, Yes, I like girls and I like everybody else. Like mm-hmm. I like cis, cis men and I like trans men and regardless of what they physically look like, if I'm attracted to you, I'm attracted to you, mm-hmm. right? Like naming that, but also having to name that I was dressing more masculine. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was hard for me to explain what it meant for me to not identify as girl, mm-hmm. but then also not want to be a boy or a man either, mm-hmm. right? And so I use, I call myself a boy, B-O-I, okay. uh, because it allows for the fluidity for me. Yeah. And your, your pronouns are? He and that. Yeah. 
Right. So like, I still identify still more masculine, mm-hmm. even though the way I present is fluid mm-hmm. and doesn't really conform to most gender norms at all. <laughs> so that was hard, overrated. Right? Yeah, conforming so, to gender norms is like highly overrated. Right. Yeah. Super <laughs> overrated. Um, but then I realized as I'm having, as I'm coming out over and over again and discovering things about myself alongside my sexual trauma, um, I'm also like now there are so many questions about how I how I experience sex mm-hmm. that it stopped feeling it at one point it would feel good to me but then I'd feel sh- ashamed that certain things yeah. felt good to me yeah. one because of what was said about my body what I was taught about my body as far as like oh if you're a girl and you have this large chest like you should show it off and you mm-hmm. should want men to be attracted to you this way mm-hmm. and I'm like well when I was younger and I didn't really have these features but mm-hmm. it was still I'm still in my body a man was still attracted to mm-hmm. me in a certain way and that messed up my sexual experience a little bit um, so that when I was enjoying sex with men or, or enjoying sex with anybody, there was always a question about my body and how it wasn't good enough or I have to fit in a certain way uh, to certain people. It, it just there was really also something messy. for me, especially with enjoyment with sex, that was, aside from the fact that it was very queer sex, that that was a mm-hmm. problem growing up in a very right. Catholic uh, family, but also the sense of like about having sex and enjoying it coming from a very pure... Catholic, aside from me being queer, aside from me being sex, right. but also I think I've struggled a lot with some of these ideas about black sexuality and about mm-hmm. that, you know, that black people are inherently more, more sexual, more sexual and that we enjoy it and not really knowing how to sort of live with those expectations and those projections right. and not knowing whether if I enjoy it, am I confirming this sort right. of like racist ideas about us being basically animals who just want to hump everyone. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I struggled with that. Do you, is that any of that sort of thing? Yeah, uh, I, so, I sometimes share this in my workshop. Um, I, had, I was dating a white person at one time and it got really, I think that made it very clear to me what was expected of my black body, mm-hmm. right? Regardless of identity, it was like your black body is not necessarily yours. It is meant to be yeah. used in this way. Mm-hmm. Right, it is for everybody else's pleasure. Yeah. It is for, and you are, you should be aggressive. Whatever, yeah. if you are masculine, you are aggressive. If you are feminine, then you are super submissive. Yeah. Right, like, yeah. and you just give. Yeah. If you're aggressive and you're masculine, like, if you're masculine, you're aggressive, and so you take. Yeah. And if you're not taking, then you're not enough. Yeah. Right. And so I was like, huh, this is confusing. One, because I'm not a man, but I know black men go through this. Mm. Um, it's also confusing because I don't identify as a woman. Um, and so, but I know black women go through this. So now I'm getting both ends of this and I don't know which one to go to. Yeah. And then also getting the message because I'm black, but uh, because I'm black, because I'm trans and because I'm queer, you don't deserve pleasure anyway. Yeah. Right? Like who's going to want you? Like, so then yeah. having a conversation about desire and who I'm yeah. desirable to yeah. and for what, um, and therefore how I have to participate in sex. And I was like, oh, it's so confusing. It's so, so confusing. Hard. And while there's just, there's, <laughs> I always, I always felt like. There was me, and there was all these things that sort of like is expected. Because also it was strange because when I when I came out to my parents, well, they sort of forced me out of the closet. There was also this expectation that I was having loads of sex. Yeah. That it was just like yeah. oh my god, I was catching dicks everywhere. You know, yeah. like it was like you probably have a type of person. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, oh my god. I, was like, I don't know. I don't know if they, they would like me. Yeah. So to me, and also because I feel like when I look at the history of that sexualized racism and which I feel like also something that we passed on to us mm-hmm. is like sex has been such a huge site of trauma for black men and mm-hmm. women around mm-hmm. around history, whether mm-hmm. it be in slavery or in colonization. Right. This sort of, and I, I, I get, I took, again, healing. How do you, how does healing come into this, into what for me feels like sort of a site of trauma? Right. And of oppression and of not really knowing, um, because I see sometimes gay men, black gay men, black cis gay men, like on, on, in the community, in the gay community, really buy into these expectations and especially if they can actually fulfill them. Mm-hmm. Um, which I mean, it's I sometimes feel might be just as bad as those who can't fulfill them. Yeah, because they their sense of value is is basically limited to, or it's sort of is 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 like yeah, limited to whether or not white men want to have sex with them. Yeah, and how they want to have sex with them. Yeah, and 
I don't know. I, 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 I've seen so many of the, of the black women in my input that I know from Burundi really struggle with these really, really high expectations of purity that come from these, and these Catholic, mm -hmm. you know, sort of Christian churches and, and so on. And, and we have, like in Burundi, we have a history of actually prioritizing female sex, like orgasms. Mm -hmm. Like there were whole, like children, like, you know, in puberty will be taught how to make sure that a woman or a person with a vagina would have an orgasm. Mm -hmm. This was traditional knowledge. This was like something you Everyone passed must on. Know how you must know, know how to, and that's, that's just orgasm, but squirt. That was the kunyad. Oh. Kunyad is like a big thing in Burundi and Randy's culture and tradition. Huh. But of course, the Catholic and the Christian church came in and said, this is, this is. The saddest evil. So where are you talking about healing? I know. Break it down. <laughs> Here's the healing part. The healing part is when you get to say what feels good. The healing part is when I'm, you get let to... Let me just look. Do you, is everything okay in the back? Is everything okay? okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. We broke through the fourth wall. Not <laughs> just checking everything's okay. Go on. Um, but it's also... So getting to name what makes you feel good. Getting mm -hmm. to, to... To say for yourself how you show up, right? If you are into role playing, let's just say, I know that I, I started off this journey kind of one by way of self reflection, but also by way of talking about BDSM and King. Mm -hmm. um, and so then seeing like my first interaction was very like not on purpose. <laughs> it was not on purpose. I did not intend for this to be the case, but I had um, an interaction with an, an ex's ex. Okay. This white guy, and he wanted to do a role play that okay. I was very surprised by. Okay. Um, it was very much about race, very okay. much about racism, but he was he was taking on the position as a submissive mm -hmm. and asked me to be the dominant. Mm -hmm. And so now we're talking about being masters and him being a slave or him, right? Ooh, right. And yeah. using his body as a white person, like because I'm a black person, like using him. And I was like, what is that about? And like, I had to take a break. I was like, wait, I was not oh, prepared yeah, yeah. for that, right? But I had to sit and think like, what would happen if I took this on as like, at least in this moment, I get to be in power. I get to say what feels good, mm -hmm. right? I get to say that this works for me and I don't have to feel ashamed about it, right? Mm -hmm. Or I get to play with this idea of shame mm -hmm. because I think we get taught that like shame is supposed to make you feel this way mm -hmm. and this is therefore how you react to it, mm -hmm. right? Um, and a lot of that is by way of Catholicism or whatever religions have been a part of our colonization. Um, a lot of it being Christianity, we all know that. Mm -hmm. um, but then what happens when you get to set the rules yourself? What mm -hmm. happens when you get to say that this is the power that I want, mm -hmm. whether it be the dominant or the submissive? You mm -hmm. get to choose your role, mm -hmm. right? And you play around that with that. You get to say when it stops. Yeah. You get to say when it goes. You get to say... You get to just explore for yourself what the joy is, mm -hmm. right? As opposed to somebody saying, this is what success and joy look like. Mm -hmm. You have a house, you have a wife or a husband, you're married, you have children, you live in this particular space, you do this sort of work. And like, we always get told mm -hmm. what should be done and what things look like as well mm -hmm. as what they feel like. What happens when you get to say, this is what I want, mm -hmm. this is how I like it, mm -hmm. and then like, there's a power in that. I mm -hmm. realize there's such a power and getting to name things for yourself, mm -hmm. and and therefore inviting other people to uh, partake in that with you. Mm -hmm. That that gets to be the healing part because some people feel like the participation must be the actual act, and mm -hmm. it's not right because we okay. receive a lot of that shame by talking. Nobody taught us the shame by sex, mm -hmm. right? A lot of times it's by way of what they said to us mm -hmm. um, before or after. Mm -hmm. And so, what if we have better conversations as parents? What if we have better conversations uh, as friends, mm -hmm. as partners? Uh, what if we have different conversations with ourselves about what our bodies are able to do as well as we, what we want them to do and therefore how they feel and experience I, I want to go back to your so I'm saying things. so many things. No, right, no, no, I want to go back to what I'm You're brilliant. Right, right. Thank you. I want to go back to, to this thing that you're saying about kink and about BDSM and about how you learned a lot from sort of like thinking through those relationships of power, basically, mm -hmm. which is what kink is about, right? Right. And and I'm really curious, like, into like how um, like who's doing what and how is this working out? Like, how what is what is what are these rules? Like, how are people talking about 
about these power relations and, 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 and in, in kink and so on. And why in kink? Why is that happening specifically in kink? Because right. that, I wonder about that as well. Yeah, um, kink, I think it comes up in kink because you have to talk about your relationship. You have to think through and talk about your relationship with pleasure mm -hmm. as well as your relationship with pain. Mm -hmm. Even if you're not doing anything like impact play, anything that will cause physical pain, um, you still have to think through what it, uh, it forces you to stretch your mind. But this right? relation, this, this this dominant and submissive thing that's also so pain, pleasure, and power. Yes. But and and this is it seems to be the one time it is the one time ever usually that you will have to think about the fact that the slave is not the oppressed like. People think slavery, they think oppression, mm -hmm. right? This is the one time when the person who identifies as, as a slave or a submissive mm -hmm. has all the power. Mm -hmm. That person is in sole control of everything that happens. Mm -hmm. And then we, now we have to be like, oh my God, I'm responsible for whatever happens to me. Mm -hmm. Because I am now the one in full power of everything, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But what happens if you can now take that idea, now that you understand that part, apply it to other parts of your life? Well, mm -hmm. one, you realize... Who is actually in power? Mm. How much power they have, yeah. as well as how much power you have. Yeah. That's that's where yeah. like really sprung my mind because I had to then think: Is this actually something I'm enjoying? Yeah. Do I enjoy the fact that he's talking about being my bitch? Yeah. Because <laughs> like, like, at first I was like, it was no conversation beforehand, so yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so he and I had to have a whole conversation like, what is this? What is this? Yeah. Right? And what is it that you want from me? Yeah. Because now I, I also have the opportunity to decide if I want to participate. Yeah. Right? And that, that was a big deal for me. For a white man to tell me, I want to know what you want and need in this moment. Okay. How can my submission be most pleasing to you? Yeah. What? I was like, <laughs> ever there were reparations like, in the palm of my hand. Could you just write that down? Could you just write that down? Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because literally, I'm one. I am still listening to him because yeah. he gets to say when it stops or goes. Yeah. But I also can say this stops. Yeah. Right. And there's nothing. There's nothing wrong with that. He can't say no to that. Yeah. It stops. So this this idea of stop because you also put this idea of of empowerment right and of healing mm -hmm. into the context of being able to say uh, this is what I want but also this is what I don't want anymore so consent I'm hearing right lots I'm of hearing consent. lots of consent right and I'm very curious because I think for me for a very long time growing up I really didn't know that I could say no to things yeah I really didn't know I really, always really framed sort of like myself as like if I say no to things I'm just being a, you know uh, a bad sport right. and I'm just sort of breaking up all the fun especially if I had started things right if we're halfway and I didn't feel like it anymore it never crossed my mind to say I would just be like I'm just gonna wait this out just, right somebody come first so just how long is this gonna take <laughs> you know and Ugh. and just being able to say no and learning that um, that I can say no and and also learning how to say no, it's, mm -hmm. it's, not that, it's not that easy. I mean, aside from saying yes, right? Because saying yes is also difficult, right. complicated, just, yeah. but also saying no is quite difficult. And I, and I wonder how, I want you to talk a little bit more about how that sort of connects with healing and sort of what does consensual sex do for us at the end of the day? It gives how does us it heal us? Ownership. Okay. It, gives us, it allows us ownership. It allows us care. Mm -hmm. That was the other thing I learned uh, with BDSM and kink is there's a lot of care involved. Mm -hmm. And that's the part nobody's talking about. No. So yet again, we're not talking about the things that make sex enjoyable, mm -hmm. regardless of how you're having it. The things that make sex enjoyable is you trust that person, mm -hmm. right? Regardless of the surprise of it all, you trust that person to like please you. Mm -hmm. you are tr they are trusting you to please them. Mm -hmm. There's a conversation that we want to do this together, mm -hmm. right? Consent. There are boundaries to it. So like, don't do this thing, mm -hmm. do this thing. Mm -hmm. Right, so all of those things are in all of our sexual experiences, but we're not talking about it no matter where we are. So when people hear about kink or BDSM, they only hear about the actual act. Yeah. They have no idea about the preparation. Yeah. They have no idea about the conversation that must happen yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the trust that must happen. Um, and then you're not talking about aftercare. Right? But isn't that because the, the ideas that people have of BDSM doesn't that also go to kink? Have to do with things like Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh kind of my movies. God! Don't watch that movie. Hey, don't watch don't that watch movie. Don't watch that movie. They lie. <laughs> yeah. 
BDSM was a part of that movie, <laughs> but it was not. A, it was do not use that as a teachable moment. It was okay. very bad. That, very was, bad. Yeah. that is what unhealthy BDSM relationships look like. Right. Yeah. You should never ever okay. want to be like Fifty Shades of Grey, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is literally the problem, right? Yeah. Because it was not about consent. It was, it was very much about coercion, no care. right? Yeah. Very much no care afterwards. Yeah. Um, but that's no definitely preparation, no nothing, like no, no control, conversation. Yeah. He was just like, let me show you my room. Why are you showing me this room? I'm like, you don't know what triggers me. You have no idea. Yeah. So like, those are things that are important. They, they must exist mm -hmm. for healthy and fun um, and full experiences uh, with BDSM and kink, right? Mm -hmm. And so I took my experience with that and was like, what if more people had this? Mm -hmm. whether, even if, whether they want to participate in kink or BDSM or not, very much just, what is the conversation? Where are your boundaries at? Mm -hmm. Can y'all talk about that? And it's not like... The other person can't be like, oh my God, that's what, really, you sure we can't just, no, this is where my line is. Yeah. And if you can't get with that line, that's cool. You can find another partner and it's not going to upset me. Yeah. Yeah. And it shouldn't upset you that I don't want to do that either, yeah. right? And that's what it is. Yeah. Um, everybody gets to say what works. Yeah. I'm curious about, about, um, about this empowerment, right? So this ownership of our own pleasure, right? Mm -hmm. Um, is that something which specifically, I feel like a lot of femme people, um, like, we're not really taught that we can claim our pleasure, that that's something which, you know, we are not, that we, we don't want, indeed have ownership to it, that it's something that we share with everyone else, right. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, right? right, and then actually some people might have more, more right claim to it. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how in your in your workshop is that something that you that, that comes into play like this this the sort of femme or f women being able to like claim their pleasure, right? I definitely talk about that, mm -hmm. um, and I talk about that in the sense of not necessarily taking I won't even say that I take the spotlight off of uh, gender and sexuality. I actually put the hi I highlight. Mm -hmm. You know how regardless of sexual preference. All the femme people always have to give yeah. something, right? Yeah. They give up themselves. Yeah. Um, or, or the idea is that they would give up themselves yeah. um, in the experience. And that is not, that's not how we do things here, yeah. right? Whatever it is, whether it be the hard sex, the soft sex, the whatever the part is, they get to say, mm. not only this is how I find myself to be sexiest, mm. right? But this is also how I want to have sex. This is yeah. how I want to be pleased, yeah. period. And there is no too many partners. There is no uh, idea of them being used, mm. right? You are used because so many people have done something yeah. with you. I hate that idea, yeah. right? Take that away. Rape culture, yeah. Rape culture, right? Yeah. Um, but then also saying like, as a femme person, understand that part of your power is also saying what the other person, how you want the other person to show up, yeah. right? Not just you. How, what kind of partner do you want as mm. opposed to you, how you have to be in order to get a partner? Yeah. That squash it. You know, you know how, <laughs> my God, do you know how life changing that was for me? When, uh, because as a, as a trans femme person, I've been really, uh, ever since my coming up, I think way before that as well, mm. I've always really struggled with being attractive enough for other people. Mm -hmm. And um, and only in these last year or so have I sort of met people who told me like it's not about you becoming attractive to other people. It's not about you becoming sort of the ideal of what these sort of and some of them are very fetishizing. There are a lot of these men that are on the prowl for mm -hmm. trans women or trans femmes, mm -hmm. and you know I get them in my grander inbox and they all write me like, do you what kind of lingerie do you wear and could you do this? Could you do that? How yeah. big is this? How big is that? Like, right. when are you going to get that done? And, and like, oh, do you, do you wear lingerie? Do you, you know, and it's this sort of, and I get these lists of requirements. When will you be good enough for me? When will you be good <laughs> enough for me? Oh. And, and, and they have the lingo, they know post-op, pre-op, and they hold mm -hmm. all these things. And it's very intimidating. And in the beginning, I was very much like, okay, then, you know, like I will never be able to be worthy of, mm -hmm. of love and attention and lust if I don't conform. If I don't conform um, and that's something that has been in negotiations, like how much of it do I want to do certain changes mm -hmm. and how much of it do I want to do it because, or else I'm just never going to be, how do I say, like sort of desirable enough. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like the standards are really high for trans women as well. Like yes. they're very, yeah. 
like people have told me like this 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 was not a man but it was it was another trans woman who also told me about like sort of like you know operating on my face and and I think about how high are these standards and how and so I was like I need to just like be me and I cannot change to become desirable right or at least I don't want to you can of course obviously but yeah. at least I don't want to however you see yourself as desirable but like and but it's interesting, yeah. But it's interesting because I don't know what is my what do I find desirable. But what do other people, you know, like I don't know yeah. where one ends where's and the, the other. Line? Where's the line? And, and I don't know. Like when I was like, you know what? It's not about how I'm gonna become desirable. Let me think about what kind of partners, what kind of people do I want in my life? Yeah. You know, what what do they? Who do they? How who who? What kind of potential? What kind of like connections do I want? Blew my mind, but I don't have the answers. <laughs> right. that's, fine. Okay. That's, that's part of it. Um, a lot of my workshop is very much about discovering that. Mm -hmm. That's the dig through. Is because we never get asked, "What do you want?" Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Nobody ever asks, especially for some folks. They never ask, "What do you want?" For masculine mm -hmm. folks, give me a list. Yeah. Right? Who do you need me to be? Some people are, are expected um, to say who who do you need me to be who how can i be yeah. of service to you as yeah. opposed to this is what i would like would you like to participate yeah. right like yeah, exactly. who do you, are you going to be in this or no yeah. okay cool like right and and so it is having that conversation and it doesn't mean you automatically have the answer because we have so much unlearning to do yeah. right black and brown, brown bodies have a lot of uncolonizing to do yeah. right? we, we have to decolonize um but we have to start even just by asking the question right and then after asking the question you can you have the ability now to really dictate how you show up mm -hmm. and we don't always get that that's the issue is that we don't get as black and brown people to say this is how i want to show up mm -hmm. right and this is how i want you to see me yeah if you don't see me like that that's cool we don't need to have sex with each other mm -hmm. we don't need to interact yeah. Right, but there are people who will be attracted to you for who you are. Mm -hmm. Period. Right, mm -hmm. surgery, no surgery, whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. um, and that's what we're looking for. For more people to at least ask the question, because then they also those people also need decolonizing. Those yeah. people also need True. to be like, oh, this person is a person, not just a body. Yeah. Right, and they get to tell me who they are, and I get to decide yeah. if I would like to interact with them. And everybody gets to play around. So everybody can can decide then. Do you want to have sex with with somebody with a bigger body? Because I know that, that has been an issue. In I met I met quite a lot of people who feel ashamed, right. ashamed of being attracted to me exactly I, because I but they, they feel like it's something that they have to explain. Right. Exactly. Well, yeah. You know, but they have a great personality. It's like, or you think that their body. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. <laughs> that's actually, yeah, it, yeah. right. And I've had a lot of conversation with that uh, about that um, growing up. Is like body shaming was a real big thing. It's like you can't be too big. Don't mm. be too big. Don't and don't like big people. Don't let people. Those are the unhealthy people. And I was like, I don't, I don't really buy that. Yeah. Because I just like people. Yeah. And so I do just like people. And I, I found myself at one point explaining. But then being like, actually, no, I just like them. And I like bodies. I yeah. don't have a, a type in the sense of yeah. leave me tall and have, yeah. like, I have no list. Yeah. Yeah. And so that used to make me feel bad because I'm like, oh, my God, I don't have a list. People think something's wrong with me. Yeah. I just take whoever comes to me. And that's, yeah. but that's not it. I'm I attracted also to different bodies. That. I also struggled. And people, somebody actually one time told me, like, but Ulaba, you have no standards. Right. And I felt so bad about right. it for so long. I was like, maybe I'm just desperate or something. Right. And I was like, it took me some time to realize, no, I'm not just desperate. It's just that I don't walk around because I've met, I don't know, I don't walk around with these sort of set of criteria mm -hmm. of what people have to like. You don't have to have a particular dick size or particular, you know, BMI or particular, I don't know, hair cut. Right. Like, if, Hair color, really? Right. Like, like, you know, people are like, I only like redheads. I'm like, wow, <laughs> sure. That's really limiting. How <laughs> specific is that? Okay. I've been okay. talking to someone, and then all of a sudden, I'm like, how would your lips taste like? See, that's when I know right. I want to get on them lips. All right. like, you know? I, I, I know I like people who have big ears. I, I, I am attracted to people who have big ears. Do I like people who don't have big ears? Yes. But I also like people with big ears. Yeah. Do I have a gender? Yeah. No. Like, I don't care. Like, do you smell nice? Yeah. Great. Do you but have a nice But I have Great. really felt that that's because I've also like sort of, I find myself, like even in moments that I find myself sexy, being a bit, I feel bad about that. And you should. Like I was at the boat, like I was at the Utrecht Canal Pride in the weekend. Mm -hmm. And I was wearing this little tank top, my belly out. I put this big 
sort of glimmery oh, yeah, so shimmer. Good, um, yes, it? and it looked like an armor. And, and I thought, I was like, oh my God, who does not want to get on this? Who doesn't? Right. And then later I was like, oh, that's like, I shouldn't somehow. It still feels as if like a big body is, I don't know. I. And then, and then you ask yourself, who says who? Who says who? Oh, really? Do yeah. you say so? Or do they no. say so? And, and even if it was, okay, they say so and I still feel the shame, let me play around with it. Yeah. What would it what would it look like for me to feel sexy in this moment mm -hmm. in 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 this body in this outfit? Mm -hmm. Let's let's play around with that feeling. Yeah. Play play with it, yeah. right? Because I really think that's when you get to loosen it up a little bit when you stop thinking so much about like, oh my god, is that their thing or is it my thing? And whose thing is it? Do I stop if it is their thing? Yeah, yeah. Because then again, you're still letting the, letting them, the whoever the them is, control how oh, you Charlie. show up, oh, how Charlie. you feel good. Oh, Charlie, you, right? you, you're so, so strict playing. with me. <laughs> Do your thing. Do your thing. Do your thing. I've done it. I've gone outside like in the crop top with the belly out and yeah. like, well, here goes the gut. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. Like whatever. <laughs> and whatever. I felt so good. Right, it's like I feel good in this moment, so let's just sit with the I feel good. Yeah. If there's nothing, if you can't figure out anything else, stick with the what feels good. Yeah. If it feels good, let's go along with that. And then, okay, well, let's see if this other thing feels good or this doesn't feel good anymore. Now we get to change. Mm -hmm. And it's not up to anyone but you. Yeah. Right? What, what would happen if more people thought that? What if, even for parents, stretching, but like I've had a parent come to my workshop and be like, wow, I didn't know how much my conversation with my daughter about sex mm -hmm. changed her experience with sex. Okay. And I was like, yeah, because a lot of the times the first person who's telling us about it is parents yeah. or some adult, right? Yeah. And so what if that conversation was more positive? Mm -hmm. If the conversation wasn't, especially for femme people, not what you should not do mm -hmm. or what you should do, mm -hmm. but asking, well, this is what has worked for me. These are some other options. You can go out and figure out what works for you. I think it's really interesting. <laughs> I think it's really interesting that you say about like we got talked into shame, mm -hmm. right? Like our bodies don't carry this shame. They they do things. They want it. They desire, and mm -hmm. you know there's pleasure or pain or whatever. But there's no shame. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something that we're taught. And I think I really like that you're saying that you're talking to also to parents. Parents are participating in your mm -hmm. workshop. And it's not just about whether they can formulate their sexual needs or consent, but it's also like how how do they talk to their children about sex? Right. And I think I grew up, you know, I connected to my own experience, obviously, because I don't, I don't know anybody else's, but mine. <laughs> um, like I grew up in a family whom I felt like, I always thought it was so interesting how my parents were uh, uh, so overtly, visibly, like sexual with each other. Hmm. But it, no, not sexual, but erotic. Like they mm -hmm. would like hold hands, they would kiss, they mm -hmm. would they would they dance. Would you know, at parties they would have we would have a lot of parties at our house, and they would be in their beautiful outfits. They would start dancing with one another. Like I remember one time we were, and this is really this is a private shit, but you know, just the two of us and these other two people and everybody else online. Point is, <laughs> I remember one time we were at this friend's house, and my parents, like in the middle of the night, I was sleeping in the. We were at other people's house, and we were like spending the night mm -hmm. at two friends. Like family friends, mm -hmm. and I was bu bu bunk bedding with one of the kids in that house, mm -hmm. and the room mm -hmm. next was my parents oh were staying there. I mean, they got it on. Oh my god! So loud. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. I was like, they were like, oh, these parents are so fucking embarrassing. Oh <laughs> and me, I'm praying that this little kid, that like, because we're both very you know, like 12, 13, that he's asleep. Yeah, I'm yeah. like, he must Please be asleep. Please, God is God is gracious to me. Please, I hope he's asleep. But he was obviously not asleep because right. my parents were getting it on hardcore. But I feel like I was taught that sex was something that people did. No, no. I think my parents were very obvious. I mean, their parents also like were very flirty with other people. I grew up my parents yeah, being yeah. so flirty with their friends. Oh, like, nice. yeah. So, strangely enough, I had those kind of examples that made me think, yeah. but gay sex, queer sex. Yes. Yeah. See, that's wrong. I had opposite. I had oh, opposite. Yeah. Whereas, like, I grew up, talk about sex, that was not a real thing. No. It was like, yeah. My dad did zap away whenever there was, like, sex on television. Yeah, definitely that. But, like, also just, like, we're not talking about sex. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to talk about oh, sex, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. We can talk about, we can see intimacy. So, like, I grew up seeing, like, my grandparents hold hands mm -hmm. or... Um, they'll maybe kiss on the lips once or twice, but and and like dance and stuff like that. But 
nothing like they are being sexual, mm -hmm. nothing like that. Um, and so, but I did see more so when I was a teenager, my mom being um, flirtatious with her her female friends, right? Okay. Like, so other women, mm -hmm. it was like, oh, look at your titties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh, look at your body. And my mom has uh, large breasts, and so my family, the women have larger breasts. And so it was, seeing women, like, seeing breasts, bare breasts was not, like, uh, wild to me. Being naked around my mom was not wild to me. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't until, one, I got older, mm -hmm. um, that it became this, like, whoa, like, Bodies are not, don't touch mm -hmm. the bodies, don't look at the bodies. Yeah. But then there's still this banter, like between mm -hmm. her and her friends. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't know where to participate. Yeah, 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 I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then it was like only women and children can do that and see like bare breasts or see nudity. But then like when the men came around, you cover up and you don't, you don't yeah. want to be sexualized. But yeah. it was never named, yeah. right? It was just cover up, hurry up because so and so is coming. Yeah. The male um, gaze yeah. was very like, yeah. Right. And so then, and when I did get older and there was a conversation about sex, it was a conversation of like, it's supposed to be intimate and beautiful and this person mm. should love you. Mm. And, but again, not actual sex. Mm. No actual conversation about sex. You're not hearing sex. And anybody who um, was, in a sense, being sexual, mm. even, whether it be about how they dressed mm. or the way that they spoke or if they did mention sex, that was bad. That's mm -hmm. not ladylike, that's not good. You don't do that. Those are for the bad women or yeah. you know, whatever. Again, not really talking about men mm -hmm. and their sexual experiences yeah. and how they show up with sex. So yeah, it was very I think it's I yeah. Saying. I think when I look back as well, uh, about these things that we don't talk about, because I think I especially when I was young, when I was six, seven, mm -hmm. there I hadn't really been well, no one really talked to me about sex mm -hmm. specifically. And I think if somebody had, if they had had, I think that that would have made me able to say no, mm -hmm. and, or at least alert somebody when uh, the yeah. worker that was living in our house started doing the things he was doing. Uh -huh. I had no context. Well, yeah, I didn't have a context. I didn't have a context because I think he also saw, told me it was my own fault that I was sort of asking for it because right. I was I was a very I was very lonely as a kid mm -hmm. because it was very very young very apparent that I would, didn't fit in. It was too girly, they thought, and everybody was trying to correct me, mm -hmm. and so I would also rebel against that, and you know, and I felt very lonely a lot, mm -hmm. and um, and with him, he would hold me, he would hug me, he would let me sit on his lap, mm -hmm. and he was very affectionate, and I was, and I needed that affection, mm -hmm. and I think he used that against me, mm -hmm. like when he started sort of also like doing like be going beyond sort of being effective towards a child that needs affection, mm -hmm. which is nothing wrong with that, right. but to actually start like abusing you know, that. Abusing that. Yeah, yeah, that and from like, from, like, uh, from like cuddles and hugs to like, you know, yeah. big rape. Right. And, 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 and me not knowing anything about that, I think made me, I didn't know I could say no. I didn't know yeah. what was, uh, are we out of time? Oh, we're out of time. We're out of time. Oh. Oh my God, I can't believe we're already out of time. Right. <laughs> Talking to you is amazing. This is good. Listen, I'm I want excited. you to come back again sometime. Oh no, I yeah. don't know when you're going to come I back. I was like, I need to come back at least three to four times. Like, oh, really? I officially move here. Okay. Like, <laughs> yeah, I got me. It's done. I'm moving. Listen, I really, I'm going to try to join the... The, 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 the workshop today. Please. And people can ask you. You can be, you can be hired out. People can like bring you over from the pond, from over the pond, to come and give the workshop, right? right? I, that's what I'm hoping for. Yes, I really. That's so actually. So, if there the are any plan. institutions watching, or organizations, or like yeah. just a fun bunch of people who want to bring Charlie over, yes, bring me over because I definitely want to. I really want to share this with more. People. You know, only five people watch these things of mine. Okay. <laughs> we can share around some more people. Too. <laughs> Exactly. There needs to be way more trans people exactly. at forefront, trans women at forefront, fam folks forefront. Forefront. Yeah, this is just a riot. Right There's so much magic. Please yeah. be in the front. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh my god, I feel like we're gonna have like a great talk. We are like, today. We are gonna have a great conversation. I'm but now with y'all. Thank you for uh, watching us and um, see you at the next Olava Talks episode. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. That was good. Wow. We just got See? to the beginning. Yeah. And I was like, I talk so much too, so we're just going to be doing this. I talk a lot. How long was this? Uh, oh, it's only about 45 minutes. Yeah, five minutes. Oh, we're going to have a quarter of a minute. Yeah, it's an hour, meestal. Yeah, it's an hour. I thought, I'm going to have 5 minutes. <laughs> yeah, over 10 minutes is so half. Yeah, down. Yeah, you have to be there the same. Yeah, it's a short one this time, but because you have to be in The Hague, you said mm. at 5 30, mm. right? Mm. Uh, I guess. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's quarter past five. <laughs> oh! So okay. we're late. Let me just let me just Whoa. eat this real quick. Okay, let me go to the bathroom. Yeah. And then we yeah, can... I thought you were. Uh...